It is the 9th of September, 1976. Mao Zedong, chairman of the Communist Party of China, dies of a heart attack at the age of 82. A power struggle begins behind the scenes, from which one man of humble beginnings emerges triumphant and over the coming years changes the very face of communist China, combining liberal economic policies with authoritarian government to create an emerging superpower. His name, Deng Xiaoping, the founder of modern China. The man known to history as Deng Xiaoping, or Deng Zhishen, was born on the 22nd of August 1904 in Guang'an, in the Sichuan province of China. Descendant of the Hakka peoples, Deng's family lived through the fall of China's last imperial age under the Qing dynasty. His father was Deng Wenming, who was a middle-level landowner situated in rural Sichuan, who acted as the head of the Paifeng village, being selected by the Chinese government to collect taxes and report on issues such as crime. His father was also educated at university, studying in Chengdu at the University of Law and Political Science, and was interested in the modernization and political reformation of the Chinese government. As well as serving as a regional agent for the central government, Wenming also collected information on political activities happening around the country. In addition, his father was also heavily involved in a religious sect known as the Religion of the Five Sons, which strictly followed the philosophies of Confucianism, Buddhism, and Taoism. His mother was Deng Danxi, who, unlike her husband, was illiterate, but was a prominent figure within the local community, and was the second wife of Deng's father, who mothered three boys and a girl, but who was absent from Deng's life from a young age, succumbing to what is now believed to be tuberculosis, dying sometime in the 1920s. As the oldest child of Wen Ming and Dan Shi, not much is known about the future leader Deng Xiaoping's early life, although he has been described by villagers who knew him as a young boy, as a stable, energetic, and happy child. And he was also marked out by his school friends as being exceptionally playful and mischievous, but also brilliant, but never rebellious. By the age of five, in 1909, Deng began private tutoring and received his honorary name, which was customarily provided by his teacher. And he became Zixian, meaning to aspire to good. He was also trained in the classical writings of Confucius and would later attend a conventional primary school, where he continued his education on the late philosopher's work and learned to recite passages from his writings. In 1915, when Deng was 11 years old, he attended a boarding school in Guang'an County, before moving on to middle school in the same district in 1919 at the age of 14, this time focusing his studies on science, mathematics, and geography. And in the fall of 1919, when Ming enrolled both Deng and his youngest son, Xiaosheng, in the Chongqing Preparatory School in France, where they completed their further education. And the reason that Wen Ming chose France for his son's education was that in China, France was deemed a bastion for political and economic learning. Thanks to its modern educational system, its robust understanding of maths and science, as well as its industrial developments. Deng was unable to obtain a full scholarship due to poor grades, and he also struggled with learning French, but he did pass exams which allowed him to attend school in France. And as his father was a strong believer in the future success of his own nation, he instilled in Deng values concerning the betterment of Chinese society. And to reinforce this aim, he exposed Deng to some of the best thinkers in the Western world, which would allow him to use what he had learned to modernize the country. Following his father's wishes for his son to join the work frugal study movement, Deng set sail from Shanghai on the André Le Bon steamboat on the 11th of September 1920, arriving in the port city of Marseille on the 19th of October. And upon arriving in France, 
He and his fellow students met with representatives of the Sino-Franco Society of Education, who escorted the students to Paris on a 16-hour coach journey, where Dung, along with his uncle, who was also on the educational program, was sent to the city of Bayer in Normandy to study at a secondary school. While in school in France, the young Deng complained of discriminatory treatment towards his fellow Chinese nationals, who, according to him, were treated like children, were taught at an inferior level, and were sent to bed early during their time in the student dormitories. And according to the program curriculum, pupils were to learn the French language initially before beginning other classes at school. Although, due to a lack of program funding in March 1921, many Chinese nationals found themselves without food and shelter, which forced many poorer students into paid work during the post-war industrial expansion of France. Many died as a result of the French course providers failing to accommodate their students, though fortunately for the future leader, and many like him, those with personal funding could continue to live a more comfortable life, with Deng surviving on the resources his father accrued by selling off his land to fund his son's education. And despite being in a relatively better position than his fellow students, a 16-year-old Deng began working for the Schneider & Company Iron and Steel Complex with his uncle, which was situated between the cities of Paris and Lyon. As Deng was unsettled by the working conditions at Schneider & Company, he decided to return to Paris after only three weeks of work to find employment and secure an education. And so Deng returned to Paris in the April of 1921 and moved into a Chinese neighborhood in the Paris suburbs called La Garenne Calomme. And whilst there, he survived on little funding and would communicate largely within his own community as he knew very little French. Although Deng had attended school in France to learn about modern technology and science, instead, his real interest lay in political demonstrations and public movements. And on the 21st of January 1921, Chinese nationals attended rallies at the Chinese embassy in France to demand better living conditions. Those involved criticized the work-study program and lack of employment, which resulted in funding being provided to poorer civilians. But the social implications introduced by the Chinese ambassador Chen Lu were inept and did little to support those who were struggling financially. And shortly after further demonstrations in Lyon, many of the students were forced to return home. During the next four years he spent in France, whilst Deng was surviving, he had very little funds for schooling. And between 1922 and 1923, when his personal funding slowed, he again found work on factory floors, including for the French car manufacturer Renault. And despite enjoying the French lifestyle, attending football matches, and enjoying local cuisine, he later claimed the first two years he spent in France were the most valuable, teaching him about the uncertainties surrounding the capitalist economic system, which was favored by Western nations. Many of the Chinese students remaining in France became influenced by Marxist and Leninist ideologies due to communist activity in the country that had been underpinned by the Russian Revolution of 1917, which prompted Deng to attend political meetings from 1923 until 1926. And during this period in 1924, Deng formed a close relationship with Zhou Enlai, who was responsible for covert publications released by the Communist Youth League, releasing their journal under the name The Red Lights. And Deng would soon become a fully-fledged member of the organization later that year, and was responsible for writing his own newsletters, and would later become editor of the journal. Despite Deng's issues with education, he nonetheless moved up the ranks of the newspaper, while senior colleagues returned to China, and he was soon a political and military instructor. This meant that Deng attracted attention from the state police and was therefore monitored for his activities, although Deng could not be arrested at this time as he had not broken any laws. But the French authorities did raid his home in January 1926, but Deng managed to evade arrest. Deng and his communist allies were aware of the raid about to occur on their homes and offices, and therefore planned to escape the country, and left France bound for Moscow via Berlin by train, much to the consternation of the French authorities. And on arriving in Russia, Deng began studying at the Soviet Union's Eastern University, 
primarily focusing on communist theory, as well as continuing effective political campaigning. He went on to become a member of the Chinese Communist Party, vowing that he had already dedicated his life to the communist ideals. After studying at the Eastern University during the time he spent in Russia, he soon moved to the Sanyatsen University of Moscow, which was established in 1926 to help combat the country's warlords, with both communist and nationalists alike contributing to the cause prior to their infamous split in the political sphere. And while studying there, Deng learned about communism in China and the history surrounding revolutions that had occurred in the region. And it was also here that he was taught in depth Marxist theory and was taught the Russian language whilst also being introduced to Russian military strategies. He learned that following the Opium Wars of the 19th century and China's loss to the dominant powers of the West, many in the country placed responsibility on the failure of China to modernize industrially, which led to internal political conflict, the consequent abdication of Emperor Puyi, and ultimately the fall of the Imperial Qing Dynasty after almost three centuries of rule in the country. In addition, the Wutong Uprising of 1911 preceded the Xinhai Revolution in early 1912, which in essence was a democratic revolution, with many in the country unhappy with the state's inability to protect itself effectively from foreign aggression, which therefore resulted in social unrest and consequently a regime change, beginning in the southern provinces of the country. And so, with the population wishing to see social reforms which would see China turned into a fully-fledged modern state that would be recognized worldwide, and with military commander Yuan Shilkai being instated as the new prime minister in late 1911, the scene was set for Shantong Emperor Pui's relinquishment of power, which was successfully negotiated by Shilkai. He then led the remaining regions of the Qing Dynasty to the north, going on to establish the Republic of China, after which the Nationalist Party President Sun Yat-sen then stepped down from his presidency by mutual agreement. Zhou Kai remained the most powerful individual in China and was named president by Sun Yat-sen in order to forge a peaceful transition of power, but he would later betray his potential diplomatic ally and seize power from the Nationalist Party, the Kuomintang, in 1916, which he did at the head of China's largest army during Sun Yat-sen's exile, although his popularity was significantly damaged when he proclaimed himself emperor in 1915. After this, the nationalist leader returned in 1917 due to Chinese political instability. And so soon after the death of Yuan Shilkai in 1916, and with Sun Yat-sen returned from exile, by this time, China had polarized into regions ruled by warlords, who held a substantial grip over the country. But the Nationalist Party, or the Kuomintang, began establishing a military government, and by 1919, they became the most dominant force in China, and successfully re-established the Republic of China by 1921. From the creation of the Communist Party, they had led a relatively peaceful campaign, meeting very little resistance from the Nationalist Party, who had dominated politics in the country up to this time. And the rise of communism, particularly in Russia, influenced many significant figures in the country, such as the future ruler, Chairman Mao Zedong, giving birth to a Communist Party which was influenced heavily by Marxist-Leninist ideologies. After learning of his country's history at the Sun Yat-sen University of Moscow, it wasn't long before Deng became a prominent figure within his class and led the communist faction at the school, and was later chosen by the Chinese Communist Party leaders to teach communism to Chinese students in late 1926, alongside other students selected from Russia. And this was all thanks to his dedication, despite producing only moderate grades in his examinations. But Deng was nonetheless dedicated to communist ideology, and his loyalty to the party was unquestionable. And so, at the tender age of 22, Deng left Moscow for Xi'an in China in early 1927, traveling via Mongolia and across the Gobi Desert, landing at his destination in March of that year to assist in military activities in the country. Upon his arrival, Deng was consigned to deliver lectures to the army personnel of Feng Yuxiao, 
a warlord based in northwest China who was receiving the backing of the Soviet Union, and before long, the communist-nationalist divide occurred. And in April, Deng found himself in a dangerous situation because of the divide between the two prominent parties. Only two years after coming to power, the new nationalist leader of the Kuomintang, Chiang Kai-shek, began a crackdown on communist ideologues in 1927, with some killed and others imprisoned for their association with the party, but Deng himself was let go unharmed, thanks to the Yixiao choosing not to violently purge the communists within his ranks. And instead, they let him and the others leave in peace, but this was to be the beginning of the Chinese Civil War. The surviving members of the Communist Party moved to the eastern province of Chongqi to regroup where a movement led by Mao, known as the Soviet Republic of China, began, and its members started appropriating land in the region, successfully staving off interventions by Chiang Kai-shek for some time. Deng then went to join his comrades in Wuhan in central China, which was home to the Communist Party headquarters, but with the upcoming threat of a nationalist offensive, the party split due to internal conflicts between the senior ranking members. But the communists soon regrouped under new leadership, and Deng entered the party as a record keeper. And it was then that Deng changed his name from Sixian to Xiaoping to counter attempts at identifying him. And it was also around this time that he met Mao Zedong for the first time, and due to a possible attack by the nationalists, the Communist Party had to relocate to Shanghai, where Deng followed, but the party had to go underground and did not have control of the territory politically. Also, during this period, he was enlisted to teach the party's Seventh Army and purged those disloyal to the party. Deng was married in 1928 to Chung Si Yuan, who was a like-minded fellow student he had first met in Moscow at the San Yat-sen University, and both had begun working as shopkeepers to disguise their political activity when they rekindled their relationship in China. However, the loving relationship was short-lived as his wife and child died, following complications during childbirth two years later. And so he was widowed at 26 years old, and was unable to attend his wife's funeral due to the nature of his work. The year of 1928 was largely successful for the nationalists, whose Kuomintang army fought with many of the remaining warlords in the country. But this alone was not enough to please the peasantry and city laborers, whose needs were overlooked by the nationalist government, despite their efforts to unify China and upgrade technology, medicine, and reform the economy. And this essentially created an opening to bolster support for communist policies, whose message was directed towards increasing the social status of the lower classes in the country, which in turn created a large following in rural areas and amongst communist-held areas. In the following years, Deng began organizing communist activity in Guangxi in the south of China in 1929 as secretary of the 7th Red Army, leading the Baiza Uprising of Guangxi, and Deng soon joined forces with Mao Zedong, who was situated in the Chongxi province, to better organize his movements following defeats to the nationalists, who wore down much of Deng's remaining fighters on their journey northeast, with many dying due to exposure to the elements, as they were under-equipped for this journey. In February of 1930, Mao had created the Chungsi Provincial Soviet Government in the region, but faced internal problems as he was seen as anti-revolutionary because of his moderate stance. And despite an attempted overthrow on the 7th of November 1931, the Chinese Soviet Republic was established, and Mao Zedong attended the ceremony, by now holding the positions of both chairman of the Central Executive Committee and head of government, although his power was diminished when control of the Red Army was given to Chinese diplomat and future head of the Chinese government, Zhou Enlai. By 1931, Deng had married for a second time, to Qin Weiying, but Deng's political career was somewhat harmed by his return to Shanghai, leaving his army faction behind, as some felt that Deng had betrayed the party and managed to escape punishment for his actions, as he had claimed he was merely a political trainer and not a commander of war, and was possibly spared thanks to the intervention of Zhou Enlai. In the summer of that year, Deng continued serving the party 
in the Chongxi province, which was becoming a political center for communist activity. And it was here that the Communist Party consolidated power and exerted political and economic influence in the region, in the area surrounding Chongxi, and all the way to the Fujian border, introducing land reforms which benefited the poorest members of society, but which also saw a rise in politically motivated crime, as landlords were often killed by workers to obtain their land. Despite the Communist Party's popularity, Mao was locked in internal conflicts with competing military strategists, with a frequent turnover in power, causing uncertainty around the strength of their army. As well as this, opposing factions debated the confrontational approach of the party and the possibility of entering into open conflict with the conservative Kuomintang, the powerful party who controlled the centralized government, leading to widespread uncertainty surrounding the Chinese Communist Party leadership. But against the odds, the communists were able to fend off four attacks by Chiang Kai-shek's men, who had led four blistering offensives in the communist heartland, which failed to strike at the morale of the group and their following. At this time, Deng was initially demoted within the party for his allegiance to Mao, who had yet to consolidate power. But due to his long-serving commitment to the party and status as a veteran, he was subsequently promoted to party committee secretary in Ritin, in the Kanzhou district of Chongxi province, which was now a Soviet administrative region in China. In 1933, Deng's marriage to Wei Yin ended in divorce as his wife left him for another aspiring politician, Li Weihun, and Deng's leadership took a downward spiral, when mounting pressure over Deng's association with Mao resulted in him being removed from all positions in the party and being placed under arrest. And although Deng was marginalized and placed on the fringes of the party for a short time, he was soon reinstated and was able to continue with his duties. Meanwhile, the Communist Party was struggling to absorb a fifth attack by Chiang Kai-shek and were ultimately forced into retreat as the party was destined for the Long March, which was a tactical and necessary retreat by the Communists. In fact, there were several long marches as communist armies attempted to evade the Kuomintang, the best known of which was the March from Changxi Province, which began in October 1934, in which an estimated 80,000 communist soldiers, with approximately 15,000 party members and government representatives, took part in a cross-country march, resulting in the deaths of tens of thousands of people from starvation, exhaustion, and at the hands of the Kuomintang soldiers with only one-tenth of those making the trip north to Yan'an surviving. It was the Long March that began Mao's path to power, as he showed great leadership skills during the march, and so gained the support of the members of the Communist Party of China. And in the year leading to October 1935, Deng was to serve as General Secretary of the party, being promoted by Mao and Zhou. And as party membership plummeted significantly across the country, Deng's rise to the inner circles of the Communist Party was gaining momentum. And during this time, he had been traveling with Mao throughout parts of their retreat. But by the end of the grueling adventure, he had begun to suffer from typhoid fever and almost succumbed to his illness. And although party membership fell, the virtue of their sacrifice in retreat and in the name of their cause was highly thought of, with many peasants hailing them as national heroes. Deng's backing of Zhou and Mao turned out to be to his advantage as they controlled the direction of the party's military, and he was given important roles in key places in the government. In the lead-up to the Second Sino-Japanese War, which began with the Japanese invasion of Chinese Manchuria in September of 1931, the Japanese justifying their occupation by claiming that China had destroyed sections of the Manchurian Railway. The Japanese remained there until the beginning of the war six years later, when an alliance was re-established between the nationalists and the communists, who unified to fight off the aggressors during the Second Sino-Japanese War, which was the prelude to World War II in the Pacific region. This led to a Chinese victory in 1945, thanks to the American intervention of the Pearl Harbor bombing, which significantly reduced Japan's effectiveness in their fight against their closest rivals. Meanwhile, Deng retreated to the sacred Wutai Mountains to spend time amongst the Buddhist monks. 
Deng returned to become deputy political director within the Communist Party in 1937, serving in a multitude of divisions within the military, known collectively as the Second Field Army, teaching communist ideology to the Chinese Revolutionary Army, whilst also serving as a commissar to the 129th Eighth Root Army, next to Liu Buchong, who is the leading commander and future long-term ally of Deng. In 1939, during wartime, the future leader was married once again to his long-term partner, Zhou Lin, who was a dedicated communist and had joined the party in 1938. But by the time they were married, the Communist Party were carrying out violent land reforms and wealth distribution while engaging the Kuomintang army into early 1940, which would be a turning point in the Chinese Civil War as the communists had significant support from the peasantry, who were sympathetic to their cause, thanks to the distribution of bourgeois wealth which was offered to them by the party. Ultimately, by the end of the Great War, and following the United States' nuclear attacks on Japan, the aggressors were forced to retreat from China, as they were militaristically and economically weakened by the bombing raids carried out over the country, and they surrendered to the Allied powers, ending World War II and the Sino-Japanese conflict simultaneously in 1945. In 1946, the Communist Party attempted to assert control as the dominant leaders within China, and as the Communist Party became strong enough to overthrow the dominant but minority governance of the Nationalist Party, the aftermath of the war saw Chiang Kai-shek and the Kuomintang government exiled to Taiwan, therefore ending the civil war and marking the dawn of a socialist authoritarian era in Chinese history. In the lead-up to the revolution, Deng remained in charge of the Second Field Army, who controlled Yunnan, Sichuan, Zikong, Guizhou, and Tibet to the southwest of the country, overseeing military education while many intellectuals and students alike were forced into educational camps during Mao's intellectual rectification program. As well as this, the communist takeover of 1949 saw the end of the Republic of China, and the state would now undergo the transition from a more conservative approach to politics and were introduced to what has become known as Maoism. On the 1st of October, Deng attended the proclamation of the People's Republic in Beijing, thus welcoming the newly declared People's Republic of China. Also during this period, Deng served as a political and military organizer, as he had done in the past, and had been applauded by Mao, who found his political skills to be exemplary. And upon establishing communist rule in the country, Deng accompanied Mao on a visit to Stalinist Russia in 1950 where they held debates surrounding Marxism, at a time when Deng himself took the opportunity to assert himself as a confident figure within the Communist Party, as he showcased his aptitude in successfully engaging foreign leaders to help secure the future of the state. The visit also discussed terms surrounding a second Sino-Soviet Treaty of Friendship, Alliance and Mutual Assistance, with much of the agreements surrounding the recognition of the state of the People's Republic of China and matters such as infrastructure and the Chinese Eastern Railway, as well as port access in Dalian and Lushuan, were primary topics, which were both returned to the country's control, and talks also secured finances to aid the revival of the country, as well as establishing diplomatic relations with one of the world's leading industrial superpowers. While the newly formed republic looked to invite support from foreign powers, Deng himself was promoted to vice premier in 1952 and held a number of positions within the government, such as the deputy chair of the Committee on Finance and later Minister of Finance, including a post as the director of the Office of Communications. By 1953, the increasingly powerful Mao Zedong introduced the first five-year plan, which attempted the rapid industrialization of China, as well as the country's transition into socialism, as the government removed agricultural businesses from private ownership and into joint state-private firms, a social reform which allowed the appropriation of land from the wealthier members of society, as it was also argued that sharing the land would help the poorer people of the nation provide for their families by removing payments of rent and ending the need for landlords in the country, also allowing people to produce their own food and so provide for themselves. 
following this. The intention was to reorganize industry and commerce at a later stage. And although the first five-year plan was successful economically, as industrial production grew at the rate of 19% between 1952 and 1957, agriculture lagged behind, with growth rates of 4% because of a lack of state investment. The gains coming from the reorganization and cooperation fostered by cooperative farming. Through Mao's centrally planned economy and collectivization of agriculture, the industrial economy boomed and the country's wealth grew, creating successful growth in industrialization as the country increased its living standards for the average person. However, more stringent plans would later be implemented, which would cause great strife across the nation. Upon Mao's rise to power in September of 1954, Deng was initially removed from his position in the party's government, but retained his place as deputy premier, and later secured positions as head of the Communist Party's organization department, as well as participating as a member of the Central Military Commission. And so he was becoming an increasingly important figure, and was later instrumental in influencing legislation as a government administrative officer within the Communist Party policy-making board. In 1956, the party underwent constitutional changes at the first session of the 8th National Congress of the Communist Party, where significant influences of Maoism were replaced in the Chinese Communist Party manifesto, removing Mao thought from the constitution, leaving only the Marxist-Leninist interpretations to guide the members. And Deng then assumed a stronger position within the party, serving as General Secretary of the Secretariat under the Politburo, and he was also involved in the country's daily decision-making, alongside President Liu Xiaoxi she and Premier Zhou in support of Mao. At this time, the Hundred Flowers campaign was introduced, where the people of China were allowed a rare opportunity for open criticism of the government. But this was not long-lived and was instead used to identify those critical of the government. And in 1957, Mao's anti-rightist movement emerged, which was supported by Deng and other authoritarians. And many of those who held right-wing views were purged, thus ending the Hundred Flowers movement in true extremist fashion. In the second session of the 8th Congress of 1958, the Communist Party put into effect the utopian idea of the Great Leap Forward, which was the second five-year plan and was Mao's vision that the country could transition into a fully-fledged communist state from a largely agrarian economy. At the time, under 10% of the population owned up to 80% of the arable land, and the changes were instituted when the communists came to power with the people's welfare in mind, creating a widespread following within the peasant communities across the country. And so the program was rolled out in China to modernize the country socially and economically, whilst also increasing the industrial power of the nation and enacting agricultural reform. The main aim was to increase China's agricultural output, which was lacking behind other European states, and so state-owned land was initially shared with peasants and farmers, with Mao enforcing quotas for food production, which the farmers struggled to fulfill. Furthermore, many of the unskilled urban laborers were also required to enter into the workforce within steel factories, as well as being encouraged to produce their own iron ore in makeshift furnaces, taking even more of the workforce away from the land. The resulting lack of labor meant that agriculture suffered and quotas were not met, but what food was produced was taken by the state to distribute to others in towns and cities. Thus, millions of people died from starvation due to the lack of food in an event which has become known as the greatest mass killing in history, as those that did not starve were punished for not meeting their quotas and forced to work through the night, leading to deaths from exposure and exhaustion. The total death toll of the Great Chinese Famine being somewhere between 20 and 50 million people between 1958 and 1962. And so, unsurprisingly, Mao became more and more unpopular and was eventually replaced by Liu Xiaoxi as chairman from 1959. Typically for the communist movement, healthcare had been an important factor within Mao's policies, with the intention of increasing life expectancy for the country's inhabitants at the time. This was also accompanied by the expansion of women's rights, allowing women to find work 
thus greatly increasing the numbers available to the labor market. But despite these efforts, the resulting widespread deaths caused by the social and land reforms caused Mao to retreat from the political spotlight to protect his already damaged reputation, only to return years later to stave off what he saw as capitalist influence within the country, led by economic reformers such as Deng and Liu, leading to what came to be known as the Cultural Revolution. Publicly, Deng supported the collectivization policies enacted by the Communist Party and was an enabling participant, although behind closed doors, it is said that the future leader criticized the program, highlighting Deng's preference for an open market policy economically that would later form the basis of the unique economic system which was introduced in Communist China. But whatever the case, contemporary writers agree this hindered Deng's career at this stage of his life, with his revival dependent on the public's perception of him. Hence, at the time, it was necessary for his future that the collective memory of the past was one in which he objected to this particular ideology of Mao in order to move forward with his career. The years from 1965 to 1972 turned out to be a turbulent and dangerous time for Deng and his family. During Mao's return to politics with the socio-political transformation of the Cultural Revolution of 1966, during which Deng was exiled for his proclivity for free enterprise, or individual self-interest, as opposed to Mao's philosophy of egalitarian idealism. Deng was humiliated and was sent to work in industrial manufacturing. Furthermore, both he and his family were sent to re-education camps, whereas his eldest son, Deng Pufeng, suffered at the hands of the Red Guards and was subsequently paralyzed following a torturous ordeal. But Deng's misfortunes were short-lived, and a resurgence occurred when he was invited back to support Premier Zhou's administration to improve the economy. And it was under his influence that the reorganization of the economy took place. And at government level, he was soon promoted to the Politburo once again, a position protected by his long-term friend, Zhou. In 1972, Richard Nixon visited China as the first post-communist era United States president to do so in an effort to strengthen ties with China, who were backed by Soviet Russia. The main aim of the visit being to help end the Vietnam conflict, in which China backed North Vietnam along with other allied communist states. And Nixon's historical visit was also the first step towards forming diplomatic relationships with the Eastern communist states in the hopes of ending the Cold War between the US and Russia, but he also had the intention of using Russia's ally against them. On the socio-economic and political level, Deng has been compared to President Nixon, as Deng was willing to adopt economic approaches which were flexible and advantageous to growth, although he remained authoritarian in his rulership style and in his treatment of dissidents. And with Deng's own brand of economics suiting the American style of business, China's future trading with the US appeared to be secured. Nevertheless, Deng's character was not always popular among senior American politicians, with some such as Henry A. Kissinger labeling him as a nasty little man, a view shared by everyone in the Nixon administration, but relations invariably improved following the state visit. Publicly, Mao showed support for his wife, Chung Ching, an actress and leading politician, otherwise known as Madame Mao, who spearheaded an orthodox radical revolutionary sanction of the Communist Party against Deng and Zhou, no doubt because of her personal dislike of the latter. And Chairman Mao, unsure of his allegiances, shifted support between Deng and Zhou and Chung Ching's radical revolutionaries. Zhou's death to cancer in 1976 saw Deng's support within the party diminished, and he was purged from the party once again by the Gang of Four, who were a political group of Communist Party officials aligned with Chung. But with the death of Chairman Mao, Deng was to return to the party, and he was once again able to resume his climb to power, but not without the conflict that followed demonstrations honoring the late Zhou in Tiananmen Square in Beijing in April of 1976. On the day of the fateful Tiananmen Square incident, 
The 5th of April 1976, large crowds congregated to pay their respects to Zhou, who was highly regarded among the populace, although not by Zhang and the Gang of Four. And so those in attendance were considered counter-revolutionaries and were labeled as such by the Communist Party Central Committee, and they sought Deng's arrest for the alleged planning of the event. On the 4th of April, public tributes were restricted, despite the 5th of April being the day of the annual Qingming Festival, when Chinese people would gather to mourn fallen heroes and leaders. But on this occasion, some took the opportunity to criticize the deteriorating Chairman Mao, as well as Chongqing. And all the while, Deng himself remained largely absent from the square, although he had been spotted visiting an area close by. And as a result, he was accused of leading the protesters, a claim he strongly denied, but which meant he lost his status as a senior member of the Communist Party. Police intervention overnight saw the removal of Zhou's memorial, and on the morning of the 5th of April, 100,000 people descended on the square, and riots broke out, with government buildings being taken over, and security forces led by the Gang of Four cleared out the square with a militia, and over 40 people were arrested, and only five months after the riots, a weakened Mao Zedong died of a heart attack on the 9th of September 1976. But at the age of 74 years old, Deng wouldn't regain significant power until July of 1977, when he was restored as the Vice Premier, Vice Chairman of the CCP, and Vice Chairman of the Military Commission and Army Chief of Staff. It was also at this time that Hua Guofeng, a military leader, governed China during a transitional period following Mao's death, and he was able to end the careers of the infamous Gang of Four who were arrested, marking the end of the Cultural Revolution. And shortly after this, Deng was pronounced as the paramount leader of the People's Republic of China in 1978 and was the de facto leader of the communist state. And he soon began ushering in major socio-economic reforms known collectively as the Four Modernizations, which reflected the areas of importance which his father had instilled in him, which were agriculture, industry, self-defense, and science and technology. Deng wished to emancipate the mind with reform of the education system, which had largely been destroyed during the Cultural Revolution. Deng also relaxed the state's grip on cultural affairs and introduced China to the common goals of hard work and prosperity, although many of the communist features of one-party domination still remained, and many believed that parliamentary democracy was a move toward capitalism, otherwise referred to as bourgeois liberalism, and this was opposed by members of the Communist Party itself. The damage caused by the Cultural Revolution was the excuse Deng needed to implement his own ideals, and he disregarded the economic argument for communism of the common market, but he was highly criticized for silencing civil rights campaigner Wei Jingsheng in 1978, who postulated that China's fifth modernization should be democracy, next to the four modernizations proposed by Deng, which were agriculture, industry, defense, and science and technology, and Deng had the activist arrested and imprisoned for 15 years, and after his release, he was once again imprisoned for a seven-month term for criticizing Deng. Deng knew that China would benefit from forming diplomatic relations with foreign nations, and he continued to formally normalize relations with America, visiting the White House in January of 1979 during the Jimmy Carter administration, a visit which was marked by a state dinner and a tour of the country, marking the first visit of a Chinese head of state since the establishment of the People's Republic. The paramount leader's visit was centered on the country's opening up policy, as well as economic reform, but some believed it was also an attempt on the part of China to seek an alliance with the US in their diplomatic dispute with Russia. And whilst on his travels, Deng visited Houston, Texas, where upon performing a public speech, an assassination attempt was carried out by a so-called member of the Ku Klux Klan, who approached the Chinese leader with a knife, but was apprehended by security forces and removed. In Deng's attempt to secure peace at home, he fought against political coercion, firstly releasing intellectuals who were punished under Mao, and those placed within labor camps were subsequently released. As well as this, intellectuals were now viewed in high esteem, benefiting from the loss of their bourgeois status, and were now seen as responsible citizens. 
Deng was made director of the armed forces as the chairman of the military commission in 1981, replacing the current chairman and Communist Party leader, Hua Guofeng, which meant that Deng now controlled the People's Liberation Army, the People's Liberation Army Militia, and the People's Armed Forces, and this was a position he held until 1989. In an attempt to curb crime in China, Deng instituted the Strike Hard campaign, which was the introduction of capital punishment, through which up to 5,000 criminals were ordered to be killed by firing squads throughout the country. This resulted in mass deaths in Taiwan, where original reports state that up to 60,000 people were killed between August and November, with conservative estimates stating that 24,000 people were killed. With the paramount leader assuming power within many of the Communist Party's most powerful chairs, Deng placed himself at the center of negotiations with the United Kingdom, and in 1984, Deng met Margaret Thatcher to discuss the handling of Hong Kong and surrounding colonies in Beijing, and arranged the diplomatic return of Hong Kong to China on the 1st of July 1997. For the second time during Deng's so far short reign, a student protest occurred in 1984 on the 35th anniversary of communist rule in the country, this time demanding that Deng deliver democracy in the country, and this sentiment was again raised in 1987, but this occurrence was met with opposition, culminating in the deaths of thousands, and possibly hundreds of thousands of demonstrators two years later in the Tiananmen Square massacre of 1989. Upon the death of high-ranking official and reformer Hu Yobang, 100,000 students took the opportunity to protest, descending on Tiananmen Square for several weeks after his death, calling for freedom of speech, freedom of the press, and workers' control over China's burgeoning industry. And on the 4th of June, the Chinese government deployed troops to remove the protesters in a violent fashion that has come to be known as the Tiananmen Square Massacre, or the 4th of June incident within China. Considered a massive political threat to the status quo, up to one million people had assembled, and a hunger strike by some of the protesters prompted the support of many of those upholding the cause. This resulted in the declaration of martial law, with 300,000 troops advancing towards the crowds, killing and arresting both protesters and civilians alike. The events of the 4th of June have largely been censored in China, and as a result of the conflict, China was subject to international scrutiny, and a trade embargo was placed upon the country, banning weapons sales to the government. Moreover, the protests saw the end of the liberalization process, but also harmed the integrity of Deng himself, and the leader formally retired from political duties as chairman of the military commission formally in 1989, although his grip on the country remained strong, as he remained paramount leader until 1992, when he was replaced by Chung Zimin. In the early 1990s, Deng's economic policies, which had largely increased the standard of living within the country, came under threat by conservative thinkers within the government, but he successfully halted any reform, allowing the continuance of his ideas, which had made China one of the largest economies in the world, superseded only by the United States, and as well as this, his economic liberalism helped the country become a top economic power. In 1992, Deng completed an extensive military purge, mainly targeting those in leadership positions, a move which saw him remove fellow comrade president Yong Xiaokun and his stepbrother Zhen from their roles, as well as more than half of the country's generals who were loyal to Yong to prevent a seizure of power within the military. His last public appearance occurred in 1994 to celebrate the Lunar New Year and the remaining years of Deng's life were spent largely in private, and on the 19th of February 1997, he died of respiratory complications associated with Parkinson's disease, with his wife Lin and their five children outliving the great reformist who died at the age of 93. China has had a long history of disorder and revolution in the modern age, with Deng largely regarded as the architect that brought the country out of the shadows and into the 21st century as an economic powerhouse, all down to his emphasis on the free market ideology rather than the common market favored by those such as Mao. 
Deng's status as one of the prestigious and symbolic eight elders of the Communist Party in China was secured alongside others such as Song Rensong, Hong Sen, and Chen Yuan, and his influence saw new reforms in the country and a series of economic changes, including the introduction of a socialist market economy, replacing the planned centralized economy favored by Mao. And whilst considered a moderate reformer, Deng had introduced free market policies, while in other regards, China remained a communist state, and he is largely considered to be the architect of modern China and is credited with the nation's economic revival, which is quite an achievement considering he was a boy of modest origins. Speaking in response to President Bush in 1989 regarding democratic voting and the operation of party politics within China, Deng alluded to his fear of a civil war, stating that if over a billion people were to partake in this type of politics, conflict would inevitably occur. So he instead chose the stability of the country over political pluralism. Deng's place as the architect of modern China, as well as a central figure in Chinese history, is fully justifiable thanks to his own brand of communism and economic reform and the free market policies he put in place to achieve his goals and aspirations for economic growth. Despite Deng Xiaoping's importance to the modern history of China, his name remains largely unknown in the rest of the world. Indeed, it could be said that Deng Xiaoping is one of the most important political figures of the second half of the 20th century, as he masterminded his country's ascent from a carnage-ridden communist state to an authoritarian, quasi-capitalist dictatorship that, for better or worse, remains the workshop of the world. What do you think of Deng Xiaoping? Was he a ruthless traitor to the policies and legacy of Chairman Mao, or was he one of modern China's greatest heroes, who took a backward communist country and lifted its people out of poverty, in the process placing China on a path to regional and perhaps world domination? Please let us know in the comments section, and in the meantime, thank you very much for watching.